Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. All right, here we go. Welcome in, everybody. It's David Summers hosting another stud cast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. It's the story of wrestling in America, as told by the stud, whose family started the profession 100 years ago. Now we step back into the ring, back into time, into the Great Smoky Mountains. That's where we'll find the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. What's going on, my man, Ron? Oh, just uh, loving it, man. Uh, got a little rain yesterday. Got quite a bit of rain yesterday, I got to say. But uh, beautiful again today. And, uh, wow, we got a good one for fans of the day, Dave. I think, uh, I think fans are going to really enjoy this one. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be talking about some things we have not talked about uh, before. All right. Uh, Hey, I know you're excited, and listen, we've we've been talking before we even started this thing about uh, the kind of show this is going to be, and so I know this is going to be a special one. We've got a special guest that's coming in, so this studcast is really going to be a good one with a live guest, and the title for it is intriguing, too. Garvin versus Stomper, and Schultz goes too far. I know that the Garvin versus Stomper part of the title comes from the southeastern Knoxville area. But the part that really has my eye going, huh, wait, what, is Schultz goes too far, especially after seeing the slap heard round the world by David Schultz on John Stossel back in the 1980s when Stossel called wrestling fake. So how can David Schultz go any further than that? I can't wait to hear that one, stud. Well, you know, uh, David Schultz is a pretty wild dude, man, uh, was, and he was really young at this point. So, uh, you know, as they say, truth is stranger than fiction, Dave. So last week, you know, uh, on the show, I got arrested. And this week, David Schultz took it far beyond that, man. It's, uh, so it's going to be a very interesting one, this one, uh, for sure. And, uh, and when a it, it, uh, simple interview, man, turns into a promoter and a territory owner's nightmare, uh, it's it's going to be interesting for fans. So we do have a rare special guest today, man, Southeastern Gulf Coast TV commentator Charlie Platts with with us. And uh, he's going to join us later in the show. And almost exactly 44 years ago this week, he was doing the original broadcast with the co-host Gordon Soley. And uh, he's going to explain everything that happened when David Schultz went too far. So uh, we're going to get to that later in the show. <laughs> but uh, we've gotten off to a slow start here in southeastern Gulf Coast. Uh, you know, when we came in, the territory was really down. And uh, then we just uh, finishing up uh, opening the best city so far with the largest crowd so far that, and, uh, in Mobile. And we were in the first ever TV rating period for southeastern Gulf Coast in May of 1978. Uh, and that's when what appeared to be disaster struck. And that's what we're going to be talking about later in this show. <laughs> so this studcast is obviously going to be a little different format than the usual one. We're going to be dealing with an unexpected event that could easily, very easily have led to the end of the entire territory. <laughs> and one that only one that only business uh, been in business for less than three months. <laughs> and uh, we're just starting to get a little bit of success. We we're finding some success. Uh, and speaking of success, Dad, after only a few months, that's exactly what your streaming channel, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com, is having success. That is the word. Fans are discovering the tremendous content that is already there with many new things going up each week on that channel. 
Well, geez, man, I'm, I'm very proud of it, Dave, that's for sure. And, and I've always dreamed of a way to bring fans to one place that has almost everything I've been responsible for in my wrestling lifetime. And, uh, and it's happening now with ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Wow, it's just really amazing. And, and to prove I mean almost everything I've done, coming up, up on this Friday, May the 27th, uh, I'm going to be doing the first reading of my novel, Brutus, the man-eating lion story that's become very popular around the world. Uh, it's really taken off. And uh, <laughs> my streaming channel is going to have its first content that isn't wrestling-related. But, but I think fans are going to find this just as interesting, man, as, as the wrestling. And I'll be reading from the book once a week, chapter by chapter, over the next month, until the entire book is in audio form and available forever on ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. I'm guessing, and I don't know, but I bet this has never been done on a wrestling streaming channel. So fans, in addition to that, they're going to get hundreds of hours of Continental USA and coming soon, Southeastern TV shows, also documentaries like the three already there, including Wendell Cooley, Dirty White Boy, and Mongolian Stomper's historic matches. They also get more than 30 stud stories, many stud cast, and classic matches from Gulf Coast and Southeastern Wrestling as well. Plus, as many as 30 stars of the sport three-hour live interviews and live stories, all new for the first time ever, filled with photos to enhance those shows as well. They're already there. Three of those are there now. Andre the Giant with more than 60 photos in it. Mankind, Mick Foley, and legendary Ron Wright with at least 30 photos in each. So what am I missing, Ron? That's a lot. Jeez, man, uh, there's a whole lot more, man. Superstars of the past shows, Dave, uh, have uh, superstars Abraham Lincoln and Martin Farmer Burns from the, 19, from the 1800s. And the next one is coming soon. It's the first superstar of the 20th century, the incomparable Frank Gotch, man, who many historians say may be the best American professional wrestler that ever lived. And, uh, wow, when you see his story, uh, you can believe it. Uh, so this leads me to another project, man, that, uh, that are going to be seen there. Uh, I'm going to be using excerpts from at least 12 of these superstar shows that I'm going to be producing to put together my next book. And this book is going to be on wrestling. And I'm going to call it The Real <laughs> History of American Professional Wrestling. And I'm going to do read that one, too, just like Brutus, man. Wow. Every time I finish a chapter on it, I'll add it to the streaming channel as well. <laughs> Wow, that's unbelievable, Ron. Two complete audio books will also be on there. This classic ContinentalWrestling.com streaming channel is just getting started and definitely going to be one of the best old school wrestling streaming channels anywhere in the world. You can subscribe now for only $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year. You get one week, a one week free trial now. And you get that for free. Simply go to ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. So, Stud, a lot to get to today. Where do we ride first? Boy, we are. We do have a lot. I'll tell you that. Uh, we're going to focus on the week of Sunday, May the 14th, through the following Saturday, May the 20th, in 1978. And I have, at this point in my life, left the southeastern Knoxville territory. And because I wouldn't be there near as much as I had been, I was not as personally involved as, as I had been. So therefore, I'm going to have less information about what's happening in the Knoxville area than I usually have. But we're still going to cover southeastern Knoxville as well. And we're going to start there this week. Uh, we're, we got a five-week program for the Southeastern Championship uh, beginning between Ronnie Garvin and the Mongolian Stomper. Gorgeous George Jr. got hurt by Garvin. And he's out. But Don Carson's in as the Stomper's new manager. And we'll look at the first Friday night card in Chihuahua Park on May 19th, 1978. First Friday night card of the summer. And we'll give some TV info. Uh, we'll talk about the results of the card and we'll give you the attendance. Then we're going to move south, man, 500 miles to south, southeastern Gulf Coast and discuss the Dothan, Alabama card of Friday, May 19th. Same night as that Knoxville. We'll talk about the disastrous TV on Saturday, May 13th, that was going to promote that Dothan card. 
Then we're going to welcome back for his second live appearance on the Studcast, Charlie Platt, the head TV commentator for me for the Gulf Coast TV show. Uh, Charlie and I will talk about the most controversial TV segment in the history of Southeastern wrestling, one that he and Gordon Soley actually took part in. And we'll get the results of that Dothan card and the attendance for that night, as well as we're going to get the attendance uh, We'll try, if we've got the time, the attendance for all the cities again in the southeastern Gulf Coast area. Mm. And if we have enough time, gosh, and I don't know how I'm even saying this, but <laughs> we'll also have another learning tree question about my being arrested in the last podcast <laughs> and uh, answer the question that this gentleman sent about what was I charged with, the amount of my bail, and was I convicted? <laughs> so. Okay, so you're, you're throwing that out there. You're going to try to force that into the show and we'll see if that happens today. So it is definitely another loaded show. I hope we have enough time to get to the answer to those learning tree questions. I wanted to ask something like that myself last week. So, but the, the card in Knoxville, Chilhowee Park Amphitheater, Friday, May 19th of 78. Let's talk about that. Let's start. Is that a good starting point? That's a good place. Let's open this up, man, up there in southeastern Knoxville. And the first match on that card was Dick Steinborn against Big Don Lambert. He was about a 300-pounder. Rip Smith took on Ron Wright. And uh, he had beat Ron Wright the week before, and Ron Wright challenged him instantly after he lost the week before. So he's going to – Wright thinks he's going to beat that young horse, man, that young Rip Smith. Tony Charles uh, is going to meet Don Carson. The great Malenko is going to be defending his newly won South Southern – Brass Nugs Championship against the former champion, Bearcat Brown. Uh, and Malenko had beaten him for the title two weeks earlier. So that's a return match. The next match was a special six-man tag with a no-DQ clause. The new Southeastern champions, Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden, who had won them the week before. They're going to welcome a third guy, another partner, Ricky Gibson, to face off against Dennis Condry. The returning Phil Hickerson, who was absent last week, and the mystery partner from last week, the assassin. And all of those guys were presented by Ron Wright. And the main event for the Southeastern Championship, <laughs> held by the Mongolian Stomper, managed by Don Carson, is going to be against Ronnie Garvin. So what was on the TV that promoted this card? Well, I said, you know, earlier, I wasn't there. Uh, you know, at this time frame, and, and I only have the format of the actual matches from those TVs uh, with the winners that were noted there as to who, it doesn't say on some of them who they wrestled, but my brother Robert was booking everything at that time. Uh, he was taking care of business there. I was going to, I would already have me a, an apartment in Pensacola, and I was ready to try to build that territory down there. And uh, while this one in Knoxville was a great TV card because Rob and I had had a long discussion about all four of the TV matches being loaded because this is that TV rating month, man. We're cramming the matches to them, trying to give them the best we can because two months from now, when the books come in, we want to be uh, looking good. So this show opened up with Dennis Condry defending his TV trophy, the one he had won last week from Robert, uh, and he defended it, and he beat Rip Smith on TV. So Conry had a quality opponent, and uh, not many guys were beating Rip Smith. He was a great little talent, man. So the second match was a six-man tag, the first one of those in a long time on the Knoxville TV. Had Robert, Jimmy Golden, and Ricky Gibson, three very popular young baby faces, and they got a win over three guys whose names weren't on the format. I don't know who they were, but I don't think they were big names. The personality profile was with their opponents for the next night. Dennis Condry, the mystery partner from the week before the assassin, and the returning from injury, Phil Hickerson. And I can only imagine what Ron Wright had to say about Condry and the mystery partner, assassin, losing the opportunity to win the held up Southeastern tag belts uh, that Robert Fuller and Jimmy Golden won from them the night before. So uh, <laughs> Wright was kind of growing desperate at this point. His Condry and Hickerson tag team, man, that had started off so strong, we're in their third week now without the belts. So he's, he's pulling out all the stops during this. Uh, third match on this TV was the great Malenko defending his newly won Southern Brass Nugs Championship on television. And uh, 
There was no opponent's name on the TV format, but I'm sure whoever it was, he didn't leave the ring without bleeding. I can guarantee you that. So, and the last match was not a title match, but I'm sure the fans didn't care a bit, man. It was Ronnie Garvin, and he was the hottest baby face in the territory uh, by far. And uh, so, and I'm sure Garvin won, obviously. He must have gone and done his knee off the top rope, uh, no doubt about it. <laughs> and I'm also sure Don Carson, in the last interview, bragged like crazy about his stomper first big win over me mm-hmm. under his management. He had just <laughs> taken over the stomper because Gigi was hurt. And uh, I'm sure that uh, Carson really, uh, really, really buried me big time, you know, and um, and then, you know, trying to put himself over to the stomper. <laughs> and, uh, and I proved, knowing Carson, he probably gave Garvin a little chance to beat his stomper for the belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So two championship matches, a six man tag and a superstar in the last match. I'd say your brother did a pretty good job putting together that rating period TV show. And what was the results of those matches the next Friday? Well, it was a very strong card, Dave. You're right, man. And, and I got the results of the matches plus the size of the crowd from my brother the next Friday night after Knoxville ran. Uh, and I was actually uh, wrestling down in Dothan. And, uh, you know, uh, he called me and, and we talked about business, you know. And we stayed in touch regularly during this time period. I might not have been able to be there. But it was critical that I knew some of the important things going on that weekend. So uh, here are the winners, man, from the Friday, May 19th, 1978 matches in Knoxville. Uh, Dick Steinborn beat Don Lambert. Rip Smith beat Ron Wright for the second week in a row. Uh, Tony Charles won over Don Carson. Boris Malenko kept his Southern Brass Nucks title by beating Bearcat Brown. Uh, Robert Fuller, Jimmy Golden, and Ricky Gibson beat the assassin uh, who was on the team with Dennis Condry and Phil Hickerson. They got the win over the assassin. I don't think they had beaten either Condry or Hickerson at this point. So Ronnie Garvin won by disqualification over the champion, Mongolian Stomper, but obviously couldn't win the belt that way. And I'm sure Carson got involved to make that disqualification happen, man, and save the belt, no doubt. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's what he was going to be good at, and that's mm-hmm. how he was going to really help the Stomper. Mm-hmm. So the next week, Garvin is going to get another shot at the tie, but uh, he had to accept a handicap match for this one, Dave, uh, with no DQ rules, and he had to wrestle both the Mongolian Stomper and Don Carson as a team <laughs> against him by himself to win the title. Wow. So that that really had to be some kind of a match because – I mean, I'm thinking if he was able to beat just Carson, d- did he get the belt? Uh, yes, he would have. Okay. And, and I have to give credit to my brother, man, doing the booking. That was a pretty unique match, man. It was a great idea, you know, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to getting the results of that. I'm looking forward to next week hearing how well that match did. And and what, what about attendance? How'd you do on that? Well, it was in the parks outside the amphitheater. Uh they had a rain, man, uh, which that happened this time of the year in the springtime, man. They had a rain, and it rained, uh, Rob said, from about 5 o'clock right up to just about match time. Uh, that found to hurt the crowd some. But Rob said it still did over 4,100 people, man. So the next show was going to go back into the Coliseum. In fact, the next six events are going to be back in the Coliseum, all of them. Every one of them until the July Fourth weekend. Wow, was I mean, was that something new that you had done with the with the Coliseum a new arrangement? Normally in the summer you were at Chill Howie Park all summer long, right? Yeah, that was that would been the case uh, since I'd gotten there in that 75, 76, 77. We were there always during the entire summer. Uh, but I got, I was kind of getting scared of the rain, man. And, uh, you know, the great thing about the Coliseum is we didn't have a problem with rain with that boy. It had the big roof on her, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so in the summer before, I didn't have any Coliseum events. Uh, even once we went to the park in April, you know, so we were uh, primarily for three years in a row staying all summer long in the park. But something did change, man. And that was the fact that the Coliseum management, 
were so happy with the crowds we were drawing and that we were filling that building up and mm -hmm. all the concessions and everything they they were selling that they brought me in to have a little meeting and they made me a sweet offer man for a rent deduction on six events oh. right, up until july 4th wow they wanted the business man so so it was strange man but uh what had happened is that coliseum that had never been run in ever for wrestling until mm -hmm. I came there <laughs> uh, because it was considered too large a building, too big a building by the prior promoter. Yep. And, uh, and then the fact that they offered a sweet deal in rent deduction <laughs> spoke volumes about what had happened with Southeastern wrestling in less than four years. Man. Yeah. I mean, they, they went from saying, yeah, yeah, maybe not. But then there's like, ho, ho, ho stop everything. So I really think this is going to be, let, let's take a break right here. We're at a good point and we got a lot coming up on this show. When we come back, is this where we're going to be finding out about the, the crazy thing that David Schultz did to cause a TV problem in Southeastern Gulf Coast? Oh, uh, yes. That and a whole lot more. I can tell you that. We got Charlie Platt <laughs> coming on with us. Uh, well, we're going to be busy here, man. I'm excited. Charlie is here. So we're going to talk to him in a few minutes and find out more about what's going on. And listen, while we get ready for the break, you know, ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com is streaming everything that you see on YouTube's Southeastern Rewind and so much more. You got to check it out. ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. We'll take a break. We'll come right back. And this studcast will continue in a moment. Big news for fans in the South. Ron Fuller Welch will be appearing in Dothan, Alabama, Saturday, July 2nd, at the Continental Wrestling Fan Fest at the Crossings at Big Creek. He'll be meeting fans, signing autographs, and selling souvenirs, t shirts, Tennessee stud masks, photos, the famous Continental Wrestling DVD five pack of great matches from the 80s, and autographed copies of his thrilling novel. Brutus. Stop by and say hello, as well as meet many other stars. Don't forget, Saturday, July 2nd, Dothan, Alabama, at the Crossings at Big Creek. Come meet the Tennessee Stud. All right, let's get back into it. Segment number two. This is episode number 251. It's another big one. The Tennessee Stud and another stud cast. All right, so Stud, are we jumping right into that David Schultz interview? Oh, whoa, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Your horse is running away with you, man. Come on now. Kind of like last week, man. Come on. <laughs> We're going to get to both of both it and Charlie Platt soon. But uh, let's start with that Dothan card, man, on okay. uh, Friday night, All right. May the 19th, 1978. First match on that card in Alabama was Mike Stallings versus Eddie Sullivan. Second match was Eddie Mansfield versus Greg Peterson. Mm -hmm. Third match was another return match between David Schultz and Charlie Cook. They'd had a lumberjack match with wrestlers around the ring two weeks earlier. Then last week, a Texas death match. <laughs> and this time is going to be an Indian strap match with wrestlers around the ring again. But this time, they're going to have belts or any type of leather strap or whatever uh, they want. And uh, what they're going to do when the, somebody goes out, jumps out, gets thrown out, whatever, <laughs> they're going to whip that person until they get their butts back in the ring, which... Doesn't take long in this type of match. Man. All right, do you are you saying the wrestlers outside the ring are going to have belts or some kind of a strap to whip either Schultz or Cook with when they come out of the ring? So that'll that's, be encouragement to get them back in the ring. That's it. Instead okay. of like picking them up and throwing them in like yeah. a lumberjack match, yeah, they're going to whip them in. Yeah. Okay. You know, and uh, and uh, you know that's a, that's actually an even more interesting thing to watch when you're a fan. Yeah, because when you see somebody's getting strapped by those belts, man, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're like, "Whoa, that's kind of hurt." It, it adds a whole new element, whether you're a fan or a wrestler. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, so that's exactly what I mean, man. Yeah, and you got it right. They're mm -hmm. going to get strapped with either a belt or a uh, some type of leather strap. Basically, you use anything you want to. I have seen guys go out and take their championship belts. Oh wow! And use them. Yeah. You know, so uh, so it, it can be a crazy event. Uh, so uh, the Gulf Coast Tag Championship was also on the line in this, this night, man. Ricky and Robert Gibson, the champions, were going to be managed uh, by Rip Tyler against the Assassins, managed by Billy Spears. And uh, so the main event uh, for the, was for the Gulf Coast Championship that I had won in mm -hmm. Mobile 
on May the 9th, 1978, the night I got arrested. Mm-hmm. So, so I'll be defending against the former champion, Bob Armstrong, Mr. Goody Two Shoes. <laughs> and, and, and I had not wrestled Bob and Dothan in the last three weeks uh-huh. because I'd been in Knoxville right. for, the last, for those Fridays, two in a row. So I'm finally back wrestling him again. You really had a lot of good things going and happening on that card. What happened on? So let's look at the TV. Saturday, May 13th, six days before the Dothan card. Uh, this TV, Dave, is going to be one of the most memorable before it's over in the history of Southeastern. So it was still in the month of May, 1978. Uh, we're in the middle of the TV rating period. And because it was our first ever rating period in that territory, well, we pulled out all the stops that day. We, we gave them a little bit of everything. So the show opened up with Charlie Platt, Gordon Soley at the set, and I was with them. And I was holding the Gulf Coast Championship belt, brand new belt that had only been uh, uh, only been around for about a month. Uh, and I had won it, like I said, uh, the Tuesday night before the TV uh, against Bob Armstrong. And uh, when this segment began for the first time in Southeastern Gulf Coast TV history, it began with a video that was shown from somewhere other than Dothan. So what we did is we videoed that match in Mobile, Alabama, and we brought it back to Dothan on the following Saturday and showed it on TV there. So fans got to see about 10 minutes of a championship match from a larger city, Mobile, Alabama, Mm -hmm. with a wild crowd, that's (laughs) for sure. And the building looked great. The crowd was absolutely electric. The finish was red hot. The belt changed hands, and I went to jail. (laughs) so we even showed a small part of the riot at, at the end of it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so then Gordon and Charlie asked why I was not defending the belt on TV. And I reminded them that I had said when I got there in Gulf Coast Wrestling down there that I would never wrestle on TV. That the belt, uh, you know, in, in my hands, and I mm-hmm. showed it to them, stuck it up in their face, said this right here proves that I'm the best and, and I don't. And I would never wrestle for freeloaders, I said, especially like the one sitting over there now on the bleachers, pointed mm-hmm. at the people over there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I said uh, that people had to pay money to see me, and they were lucky even then because I was so beautiful <laughs> and so athletically talented. I, I'm, not laughing, I, I'm not laughing at your looks, I promise. I, that's a, that was just funny. I can, I can only imagine how the studio fans were reacting to this. So tell us what happened the next day uh, to, uh, on the TV that day. <laughs> okay, so after that, yeah, you know, they, 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 they got a little upset. They booed me a little bit, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I went in the back and smiled about it. It was great. I loved it, you know. So uh, the next thing up on the card was Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. Bob Armstrong, man, <laughs> you know, and then boy out, he prances and, you know, and uh, he changed the attitude of the studio immediately, man. You know, he entered, man, and then he shook all the hands and then he kissed the babies and he even kissed the butts of some of those that I just rebuked, man. You know, <laughs> and boy, but then he lit them up, man, even more. Boy, he had a tremendous TV match, man. And then he put his opponent to sleep at the end of it. Uh, (laughs) Bob Armstrong was absolutely on fire. After only 11 live TVs, there he was on fire. Okay, so when are we going to bring in Charlie Platt, Stud? He's uh, he's actually sitting in my living room right now. In a few seconds here, Mr. Impatient. (laughs) (laughs) I I want to set the stage a little bit. Okay. Okay, so see. <laughs> I want to say a little bit about the future wrestling Hall of Famer, David Schultz. You know, uh, he's involved in this segment. And, uh, and, and he was born very close to the same town of Tennessee that I was born in. You know, we were only born about 30 miles apart. You know, and he was trained by one of the toughest men on earth, in my opinion, my grandfather's brother, Herb Welch. And uh, so David uh, was just getting started in wrestling. And uh, he was about as gung ho and crazy as any young wrestler I ever met, man. Wow. <laughs> he, he were, he, we were very similar ages, but he was a lot wilder than I was. 
And I guess anybody would agree with that, man. If they know anything about the wrestling slap heard around the world, that's, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> so they'll know what that's all about. Yeah. So back in 1978, <laughs> he and Charlie Cook, which was another great young star at this point, uh, they were both working hard, man, to move up the card. And he got maybe a little bit too overzealous to make it into the main event. And, uh, and I've kind of intentionally saved this spot. Uh, in this show here, uh, because it's exactly the same spot it was in the show in uh, 1978, 44 years ago, in the mm. personality profile in the mm. middle of that show. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, now, man, Dave, I think it's time to introduce Charlie Platt, man, the head commentator of the Southeastern uh, Gulf Coast TV show back in those days. And he's going to tell us all, man, exactly what happened to him, co host Gordon Soley and Charlie Cook on the personality profile of this notorious TV show of May the 13th, 1978. Well, I'd be glad to do that. Every time you say that he's going to be on the show, that means he's coming over to my place, and I'm still a little unsettled about that. But here he is, longtime friend, broadcast personality locally. We've got a lot in common where that's concerned, but then how many years uh, How many years with wrestling on TV? Ooh, uh, a little bit from... 76 through last show I did was in 1993 for USA and the Dauphin end. Yeah. And then also some time locally on TV. And now he's just uh, stud. He's complaining about cattle a lot lately. So I don't Yeah, yeah, he's becoming he's become a rancher, man. Yeah. He's yeah. A rancher and farmer, man. This is yeah. how he spends his time nowadays. Charlie, so uh, t- tell us what you need with cattle. Can we help with the cattle plan? Yeah, we we need some folks to go out there and help us uh, work the cattle, and wrestle the cattle and stuff yeah. like that. And you know that the cattle shoot. They do not work. They shoot. Just shoot. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Stud, could you take some time off and come down and help out? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got a little bit of a, a little bit of experience in some of that stuff, man. Heck, heck, buddy, yeah, buddy. I used to be around the rodeo, and yeah. I broke a few calves, and I've ridden a few when I was a little boy, eight year old. I used to ride them calves. Listen, you know? listen, with Buddy, with Buddy Welch as your father, uh-huh. there's not much in life you did not do by the age of sixteen. I was going to say, bring your brother, bring your brother on down, and y'all, we got some bail uh, hay, hay, hay bales that we need slung around. So <laughs> for sure, you ain't get Rob's lazy butt down there, man. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> no hay. I can tell you that. Oh me, so I tell you, Charlie, it's great to have you on with us today, man. And uh, we're we're going to talk a little bit about uh, something you're very familiar with, and an incident that happened on the television show, probably uh, two three months in. Uh, Gordon Soley had just been doing a, the show for a couple of weeks with us, two or three weeks. And we had a personality profile set up on this show. And, uh, and, and I've kind of set it up here for fans and everything. Uh, so they know that this was the, about the middle of the program. And you're out there on the personality profile with Gordon Soley and with Charlie Cook, uh, who is a pretty big athlete star in himself. You know, at this point, and uh, and I'm going to turn you loose. I just want you, Charlie, to to tell people what happened well, on this particular day. Ron, it's always a pleasure to be around you and and Dave. He and I take on a lot of each other and carry on, but we're <laughs> we're, we're brothers of the old microphone at many radio stations. That there's not many we hadn't been fired from together in some <laughs> cases, but no. You have to look at the history of this territory, wrestling fans. Uh, think back in the in the 1950s when this uh, territory originated. It was by uh, Ron's father, uh, Buddy Welch, Buddy Fuller, uh, stage name, uh, wrestling name. And it had seen 40,000 people in Ladd Stadium, Mobile, Alabama, to watch Buddy against Mario Galento. It has seen every major star in the wrestling business worldwide come through these area, this area, from like 1954, and we're we're up at 78. But there was a, a time period there that uh, the owner of the territory that Ron and everyone bought it from, Lee Fields, Ron's cousin, had, had taken a, a, all he wanted of wrestling, and he had lost interest in the business. And racing was uh, Lee's new new thing, and he was great at that and great greatly promoted. And uh, his widow still today 
has Mobile International Speedways. But the thing was, we had gone through a dry spell here where it was just put two guys in the ring against each other, no major angles. Some angles were being shot, but not, not many. And here you had a whole new crew of guys coming into this territory. It was kind of a pioneer situation for them. You had, uh, as we will talk about, former Pittsburgh Steeler Charlie Cook, David Schultz, who uh, also was running with a guy that was the assassin, Roger Smith, who, in my opinion, and we all have those, two of the tough guys of the industry back in that time period, it was guys a fan did not want to go up against. It was uh, two guys that <laughs> a wrestler did not want to get out of line with in the ring because you knew you were going to get kicked somewhere in, in the whole process. <laughs> and and these guys were pioneering this territory, and they were taking it to the limit to get heat. And heat they got. Uh, David Schultz, trained by Herb Welch, uh, old shooter himself, uh, he had come up the hard way in the business, and and he made David respect the business. And David respected the business, and he wanted everybody around the business to respect it and mm. protect the business. Mm -hmm. And that he did. He, uh, I've seen him in many situations. We, we, you mentioned the John Stossel situation, uh, the slap heard around the world. Yeah, he, he he defended what made him a living. And he and Charlie Cook, I, I, together, came up with an angle. They were in a program together. And, and here again, David not been here a very long period of time. They were maybe, as, as someone would say in aviation, overshooting the runway <laughs> to, to, <laughs> to get that much. That's a good way of putting it. Well, heck yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, they, they, they went above and beyond when the, with this angle. It had something like this happen today. Oh my gosh! Mm. But wow. back back then, you had Charlie Cook, African American, a great uh, football player, Pittsburgh Steeler, entering the wrestling business, wanting to make his way up the ladder. It's no secret if you were opening match, you didn't get paid as much as you did if you were in that main event, mm. and and everybody wanted it sometime or another <laughs> as much as they could be to be in the top pay spot. Yeah, and. You would want it in Radio Dave. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. I want the top price for a cow at the auction, and <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just <laughs> it's just the way the money thing goes. And Ron, you have been talking about uh, on this these studcast how Charlie Cook had taken a couple of wins from the legendary Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd put him over, so he was big time over as he was getting into this uh, situation with David Schultz. Uh, that's correct. Uh, he actually beat uh, he beat Ernie Ladd right there in uh, Dothan. Ernie put him over in Dothan, man. The second uh, show we ever had there. I never will forget uh, working with Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> Let yes, me tell you something, you know, Mr. TV announcer. Let me, Mr. TV announcer. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was no Gordon Soley. <laughs> there was no Lance Russell. There was no anybody announcer-wise. There was no Charlie Black. Mr. TV announcer. <laughs> yeah. How many yeah. times so, did you hear that? Well, <laughs> but, you know, you, you've covered there, man. And then you, Charlie, I mean, that's a great point, uh, you know, Dave, about uh, about uh, Charlie being over oh, uh, yeah. because he got wins over Ernie. Yeah. But at the same time, uh, this particular stud cast is running rampant with heat. And Jesus, that's what we did, Charlie, that think that really <laughs> made us explode down there is we got heat. Yeah, and, oh. and in the arenas, I can remember in, in Dothan, in this time period you're talking about, I can remember, you know, folks like Roger getting that heat out there during the match and then a fan coming up and just getting close up to him, try to act like he's going to hit. Roger would grab him and take him to the back of the building and smash him into a metal door. <laughs> Saw it more times than one. I mean, this was a heat magnet down here so yeah. Char so charlie cook and david concoct this angle let me set it up it's personality profile a time period in the program where we profiled a wrestler mm -hmm. or an event coming up a certain type of match coming up mm -hmm. it was our it was our steal some tv time promotion time to get down to business yeah, that's what we did uh we we took it as an extra commercial time promoting our house shows 
And the big match was Charlie Cook against David Schultz. I don't remember all the specific rules and regulations, but it was uh, it was a heat building it, it, situation. It was an Indian. It, it was a is a lumberjack style match okay. with the straps. Okay, the guys had uh, the straps. Okay. Uh, and David and, and back into the ring and, and, and David and Charlie wanted to get all the heat on David. They could, uh, going into this match. So here we are personality profile. Now this is the interesting part. There are no audience in the TV station. It is just the wrestlers. Hmm. And usually we know we being me and Mr. Soley, what is about to transpire. Mm-hmm. You know, we, so you're saying this time you you had no idea what we was, did not. We knew that Schultz was going to come out right. at a certain point, yeah. and interrupt the interview, but we did not know how Schultz or what Schultz was going to bring with him to do the interview. Oh, okay. So Gordon's on one side, I'm on the other. We're interviewing Charlie Cook. We're talking about his Pittsburgh Steeler career and his transition into wrestling, and you know the. Probably talking about the the win he had had over the Ernie the Cat Lad. We were just really, you know, getting him over. Mm -hmm. Out comes David Schultz with a about 25, 30 pound watermelon in his hand. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Now, again, Charlie and David had got together on this. Right. I didn't know what was going to go on, and Gordon didn't know what was going to go on. <laughs> and I didn't know. I oh, know. listen. You would think at least I would know. The big dog himself did not know? <laughs> oh, this is how this is how they tried to put this thing. They, they did put this thing out there, which was a risky thing, and nobody knew, but they had gimmicked that watermelon on the bottom where you couldn't see. It had been cut across on the bottom. Oh, okay. So if you touched it with your thumb, it was going to fall apart. Right. So out they cut out. Schultz comes says, and gets into this argument with Charlie Cook. And before Charlie could stand up, David smashes the watermelon over his head. Holy cow. Okay. Had Gordon and I known. Four years ago. Let, let's yeah. Let's, yeah. Yeah. Let's yeah. yeah. In there, folks. yeah. <laughs> Had Gordon and I known about this, we would have worn different clothing from what we wore some of that uh, double knit polyester where it would <laughs> run off you know because gordon and i sitting there soaked with watermelon juice <laughs> and pieces of watermelons mm -hmm. and i never will forget gordon was uh, he would light a cigarette from a cigarette during the show i mean Ron, go ahead and back me up on this. That's just, oh, yeah, yeah. that he, was Gordon. But you wouldn't he, see him smoking on the show. No, you okay. wouldn't see him smoking right. on the show. Heck, I was doing it too, but you didn't ever see him smoking on the show. But <laughs> Gordon just really started eating cigarettes for the rest of the day. I can't believe they did that. I cannot <laughs> believe they did that. That is dangerous. <laughs> you know, wow. But it was, and it, it was a, it was overshooting the runway, but oh, the heat. That wow. David Schultz got, he oh. could he could not stop at a gas station and go in the restroom in peace. <laughs> Golly, I'm serious. You remember yeah. it, Ron? It, it was. Oh it was yeah, fun. yeah. And, and you know, uh, just for people that are listening to this, uh, you know, there was a lot of implications to this. Uh, you know, it's 44 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, and it, like Charlie said at the beginning of. Uh, talking about this as if this had happened in today's time frame, something like this. Uh, <laughs> God knows oh, <laughs> that it had never been heard the end of it. Uh, it was still way, way out there. Mm, <laughs> it was, yeah. It was. He, they had gone too far, and uh, and and I and I kind of understood because, uh, as Charlie said, they both wanted to get over. They wanted to get to the main event. Uh, they were hustling, man. They were. And, uh, wow, were they having great matches with each other, too. That was part of it, man. You watch them every night and go, geez, these guys want it. And, and, what, and made I, it, what made it so good and, and so with David, and I'm going to say this about David, going back to Herb, his trainer, no matter how hot of an angle David was in, how many fists were thrown and wild punches and all the crazy stuff, beating each other over the head with boards, You'd see David go to that front chancery. You'd see him jump down 
out of the middle of, of the heat and go to a basic wrestling move from time to time. And that is part of the success hmm. of this territory. Well, wow. it was built on what was on the marquee hmm. wrestling. We talked about some wild stuff today, but it always went back. If you could wrestle in that ring and show people you knew what you were doing, you'd get over and you would draw money. Yeah, wow. it, it, it was, uh, it, it was what, that's why we had the crew we had, man. We had a lot of wrestlers in that first crew and, uh, guys that, uh, wanted to, wanted to do as much wrestling as they could. And they just kept coming for that first summer, man. You had the Tony Charles arrive and the mm. one after another, after another, uh, guys that were really wrestling based and, uh, and uh, you could do some crazy things like bust watermelons on people's heads. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, when you got in that ring and the, and the bell rang, uh, wow. The, you really had to, uh, if you showed those skills, it really didn't make any difference about the rest of it. Man. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> was, that overcame everything else. Was Charlie sitting down, standing up? What was his position? He, he was sitting down in a chair between. I was right. in a chair, Gordon yeah. in a chair. We were on opposite sides, and Charlie was in the middle. Okay, so then David has the, it's, you said it's 25 pounds. Yeah. So he's got the watermelon. watermelon in both hands, I'm assuming. Just does he drop it down on his head, push it down? What, what happens? He comes out there and offers it as a gift to Charlie. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, yeah make okay. it worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he he wanted to make peace with Charlie, right. and, and give him a watermelon. So, right. Yeah. yeah. It, it it you can't you can't imagine the heat, and you can imagine what it would do and today. You, you said oh. it was gimmicked on the bottom, so it when you put that when you drop that on somebody's head, twenty five pounds, you that could be a serious injury. Well, yeah, they, they could be, but the way they had it, it was just going to fall apart. Right. When it hit something. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Wow. And, um, and Ron didn't know about it either. I think he's in the control yeah. room screaming oh, yeah, yeah. up there. I, like I a, up, you know, Charlie, <laughs> I used to be up in the control room a lot. Oh, with yeah. Wayne, with the producer of the show. And uh, and when he walked out with the watermelon, I was like, uh-oh. Uh, because I knew David, right? I mean, like, oh, uh-oh, yeah. oh, man. Th this ain't going to be good. And uh, so, you know, and, and I really appreciate you coming on, Charlie, and Enjoying doing it. this and telling this story because uh, uh, in, later on in this stud cast, we're going to actually talk about uh, how much heat he had. Wow. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get to that in this stud cast as we go forward here. And uh, gosh, I appreciate it, man. As always, you're showing up and uh, doing it. Uh, I want to I say, say one thing. Always great working with you and something you and I had a conversation not too long about not too long ago about it's down to where you and I can be called survivors of the, of that crew. And uh, <laughs> a lot of the, the, the wow, guys yeah. we worked with that are no longer with us. And a lot of the guys that we talk about in these, some of these matches are no longer with us. So it's a pleasure to be here. And with that, I'm going to say this, God bless y'all. And 10 years ago this week, Dave can add to this 10 years ago this week, I smoked my last Marlboro cigarette. Congratulations, Oh, congratulations, Thank my yeah. man. And that was only minutes before. Well, it was the doc. The, the, the cardiologist <laughs> saw me throw it out the window when my son drove me into the emergency room. I mean, yeah. It was, it yeah. Was, and then before long, they were wheeling him into the surgery room. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Wow. wow. I almost died, my that's man. A, that's a good Thank reason God to quit. That. Thank God you're still with us, John. I, I, Dave, how long has it been for you? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. He threw yep. him down. Yep. Yep. And we're... Yep. Uh, we're much the better. In fact, he he made me mad. He said, uh, "You can come out of the house. I, I, I'll have time to take a shower because I I've been at the gym today." <laughs> Not only has he quit, he's at the gym today. Yeah, yeah. yeah boy. Oh, yeah, I'm boy. up to I'm up to 114 pounds, y'all. <laughs> yeah, boy. Love you guys. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Charlie. Appreciate Always you being here, man. Well, I tell you what, that's going to be very hard to follow, Rod. So, what happened on the show after that? Well, David sure came back in the studio and he had a live match after, you know, and they were still mopping up the watermelon, man. When the, oh when the studio exploded with booze, man, when he came <laughs> back after that, they're over there cleaning the studio up and uh, we're filming the next match and he walks out into the, <laughs> into the studio and wow, did they, they were mad. I mean, so, you know, he had almost instantly become a top heel. 
that's what had happened, that one little deal. Mm-hmm. And he also, during this match, pulverized another unknown wrestler who I don't remember the name, but a guy who probably considered staying unknown after that match. <laughs> I mean, Schultz made a point of kicking this boy's butt. <laughs> it was unreal. So then the last segment of a pretty much already unique TV show wasn't a disappointment either, I can tell you that. Uh, Ricky Gibson and Robert Gibson were going to defend their newly won Gulf Coast tag belt on the TV show, and the last match of the show, against an unknown team. You know, So uh, before they did the match, though, the Gibson brothers and Rip Tyler came to the set with Charlie and Gordon, and they watched the video of their six-man elimination tag match from Dothan the uh, night before, where Bob Armstrong had put up the $10,000 bet for them that Billy Spears challenged them with. Uh, and uh, and it was, uh, it, that bet was made in the last show. And uh, so that was the match from the, that came up there and they had that money at stake. And so he wanted, he says, you know, uh, he challenged them again. Uh, you know, he says, uh, so Mr. To start that segment back over. The Gibson brothers, Rip Tyler, came to the set with Charlie and Gordon Soley to watch the video of their six-man elimination tag match from Dothan, the one where Bob Armstrong had put up a $10,000 bet that Billy Spears had challenged the Gibsons and Tyler for, and they didn't have the money, which was in last week's TV show that the challenger was made, and uh, that they could beat his team. You know, So on the end of that video, from last Friday's match, after Spears and his team had lost again, all three returned to the ring, and they took the 20000 in cash from the timekeeper. Basically, they stole the money after losing the match. Wow, mm-hmm. pretty mm-hmm. bad deal, right? <laughs> so uh, Southeastern Wrestling had uh, already uh, sent something to Billy Spears, and, uh, and uh, obviously Charlie was aware of it, that... Uh, they had already sent a message to Billy Spears that uh, the day before that this TV that he was to return the money on TV to <laughs> Bob Armstrong during this TV show, or else all three of them would be gone from uh, Southeastern Wrestling. Yeah. So Charlie Platt, at this point, uh, he's sitting there with the two Gibson brothers and mm-hmm. Rip Tyler at the de- at the set, and uh, so Charlie asked Billy Spears to come to the set and bring the money. It's going to resolve the issue here over the stealing of the money. So Spears came out, uh, but along with Spears, he brought his team with him. And uh, so before handing over the money, he wanted to make another deal to the Gibson brothers and Tyler, which were still sitting at the set, like I said. And he, he, he said, you know, he'd give them, he'd give the money back but only if his team could wrestle the Gibsons on TV Mm. right then for the belts. Mm. So he's trying to bargain for money he stole. (laughs) So that's basically what (laughs) it was. Right, right. So, yeah, so, you know, and these three guys got up on their feet. They they were like, hey, wait a minute, Uh, you know. And uh, things got real tense in the studio, man. Uh, These these six guys are about to go at it, and there sits Charlie and – and uh, Gordon Soley, and, and you know, so, uh, and and it looked like uh, something was about to happen until the man who had put up the money, Bob Armstrong, he entered the studio, but he entered from a door behind the three of them. They didn't know he was in the studio. And the studio crowd, they were already electric with this confrontation that was about to happen. And they went crazy when they saw Armstrong, and he shoved the two assassins aside. And then he snatched the $20,000 from Billy Spears. And uh, the Gibson wow. brothers and Tyler, man, as soon as they saw that, they just called over the desk and they started into it with the assassins. <laughs> and, uh, and then Bob Armstrong tossed the bag of money to Charlie Platt. And he grabbed old white-suited Billy Spears, who was trying to run back to the dressing room, <laughs> caught him and drug him over to the camera and put him over his knee, and he started uh, spanking his butt <laughs> like he was his daddy. Oh, my God. That is absolutely wild, Rod. So so what happened next? I mean, did they did they get to the last match? Well, it was total pandemonium in the studio, as you can imagine, <laughs> you know, and Charlie and Gordon, you know, 
They called for help from both dressing rooms. They had to get the fighting stopped and get control. There was supposed to be a TV, yeah. uh, tag team championship match right. on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Spears and the Assassins, they beat it back to their dressing room, and all the baby faces returned to theirs except for Ricky and Robert. And they went back to the set, and their belts were still left laying on the set when they crawled over the set to get started with these boys. And they picked up their belts, and they said to Charlie and Gordon, they said, uh, i tell you what, we'd be more than happy to defend the belts right now against the Assassins. Tell them to come bring their big old fat butts out here. And they went and got in the ring, right? <laughs> well, the studio exploded again, man. They're going to see a main event for the championship. Wow. So, so time was running out on the show. You know, a lot of stuff had gone in this program, man. And then the Assassins, as the Assassins, man, they stormed out of the dressing room, man, and they shot up in the ring. They rang the bell with no introduction, and all four of them just started fighting in the middle of the ring. There was no tag match. It was nothing but a fight. And Billy Spears all of a sudden bolted from the dressing room, and he handed something to both the assassins, and they inserted it into their mask. It was uh -oh. the old uh, assassin team that used to be in Georgia that were the champions for so long. Mm -hmm. They did it so many times. Yep. And, uh, and they put something in their mask, and then they got the Gibson boys stopped, and they headbutted each of them. Each of them headbutted, uh -huh. and um, both of them, both the Gibson boys went down on the mat, obviously. And then one assassin covered Robert Gibson for the three count. Mm -hmm. Title changed hands right there. The other assassin, uh, he got Ricky up again, and he headbutted him a second time. And then he just uh, kind of hung him over the top rope, and he and he flipped him over until he landed back first on the concrete right Ooh. in front of Billy Spears. Oh wow! And uh, Billy, uh, you know, he he managed to get Ricky Gibson up while the two assassins are beating the heck out of Robert at this point. Uh, Billy Spears gets Ricky's head between his knees, and he pulls him upright, and he pile drives him man on the concrete. Mm. And uh, wow. Ricky was already limp, man, when he when he piled drived him. Yeah. And then he was gone. So so time on the show had run out at that point. Uh, Charlie and Gordon, man, uh, started closing the show. There was the assassins <laughs> and spears up in the ring holding up their belts. And then there was Robert Gibson on the floor in front of him, bent over, man, uh, <laughs> checking on his lifeless brother. Wow. All right. So that had to be one of the best television wrestling shows maybe ever done. So... What what about the next Friday night? Well, Mike Stallings beat Eddie Sullivan in the first match. Eddie Graham uh, beat Greg Peterson. And because of what happened on the TV show six days earlier, the Gulf Coast Championship tag match that was scheduled to be the Gibson Brothers, managed by Rip Tyler, uh, against the Assassins, managed by Billy Spears, well, that match didn't happen, obviously, exactly that way. Ricky Gibson was hurt bad, and he went back to Knoxville. And, uh, and actually, he went the day after the TV show. Uh, he didn't wait till the whole week. He had to go back to Knoxville to recuperate. Uh, Rip Tyler, who was scheduled to manage the Gibsons, took Ricky's place and became Robert Gibson's partner. And uh, so they're going to wrestle in the place of the, the two Gibsons boys. And the Gibson boys defending the title. Now the assassins are the champions. So... Uh, Ricky Robert says, uh, yeah, I'll take Rip Tyler as my partner. And he says, but uh, we want a championship match, you know. So Spears, man, he could have very easily said yes, but uh, he wouldn't allow his team to defend the belts, he said, against a mm -hmm. team that they weren't booked against. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, they could not they could have the match, but not for the belts. So you can imagine how that went over with the fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I can see that Billy Spears and his team were really getting some heat. I mean, good heat, especially after what had happened on TV six days earlier, of course. But I can only imagine what the Farm Center crowd sounded like when he refused to make it a title match. Well, it got worse, Dave, I can tell you yeah, that. I bet. Uh, Robert and, uh, and Rip, uh, they won the match. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously won for the championship, so they didn't get the belts. So, uh, so then in the in the next match, I kept myself in you know, my Gulf Coast the championship by getting intentionally disqualified against Mister Goody Two Shoes, Bob <laughs> Armstrong, and uh, he got his hand raised. 
but he didn't walk away with a belt, which made the crowd even madder. Wow. Okay, so now the Indian strap match between David Schultz and Charlie Cook, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we had put it on last because yeah. every wrestler in the building was needed to take part in that match, and it yeah. made no sense to have guys out there whipping people with a belt or whatever before they had their regular match. So uh, this was scheduled for the last match. And, uh, and every time we had one of these lumberjack-type matches, I always did that, uh, put it on last, uh, uh, because it just uh, it made more sense to, to be in that position. Okay, so you've been saying every week, Stud, that heat on the heels built business, and you've been really proving that too. You've got a lot going on right now. So after that great TV, six days earlier, and now in the arena, tell us what comes next. Well, the crowd was wild, man, from all the heat so far that night. I mean, the heels, I think, had won every match. So all the wrestlers with their belts and their straps came down to the ring first. Uh, Charlie Cook uh, came out of the dressing room, and, God, he got a roaring, roaring and, uh, it, it was amazing. I was, I was like, wow. The, he he was over, and he'd been the one that got the watermelon smashed on him, right? So, uh, <laughs> and then when David Schultz came around the corner and out onto the dirt floor of the building, man, where fans could see him, there was an absolute explosion of booze. Hmm. And and you know, like and like all great heels, man, uh, Schultz was was getting to be a great worker. He milked that booze, no booze, man. He stopped and he looked around the entire building, took his time. And the more he stayed there and the more he looked, the louder they got. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, Dave, from having been in that arena many times, mm -hmm. uh, mm. you, you've been there, yeah. uh, you know, the concrete, concrete bleachers there run, run from the top of the building all the way down to floor level. Right. And there's that thick iron pipe about three feet high that, at the bottom of the bleachers that runs along the length of the building on both sides. Yes, I know exactly what you're talking about, Ron, to keep people from falling off the rock walkway in front of the bleachers and onto the floor of the building. Now they have a chain link fence, but you're right. It wasn't just an, uh, an iron pipe at the time. It was an iron pipe. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. And uh, well, all of us heels were waiting out down there at ringside with our straps and about four policemen at this point were starting then. Finally, Schultz decides he's going to come on to the ring, and they are walking with him to the ring. And, and I look up, man, at almost the top of the bleachers, day, and I see this huge guy. And, uh, and he starts running down the bleacher steps toward the arena floor, not walking. He's running full speed down mm -hmm. those steps, right? Wow. And, uh, and when he gets to the bottom, he looked like a long jumper in the Olympics, man. He's running at full speed. He jumped and put his foot on the pipe, and he, at the end of the bleachers there, and he dived through the air, and he landed on David Schultz's back. Whoa. And Schultz staggered because this boy was big, and he didn't expect him. He never saw him coming, and he almost fell. He almost fell, but then he suddenly mm -hmm. uh, he uh, got his balance back. He righted himself, and he reached up and grabbed the guy by his hair. And he yanked him over onto the ground in front of him. Whoa. Uh, onto the dirt out there, right? Right. And there was still dirt at that point at yeah. the old farm center. Yeah. And uh, so once he got him onto the dirt, uh, boy, the heels had been, you know, I had, we had the four days earlier, we'd had to ride in Mobile. Uh, you know, we had talked that this is getting hot, this is dangerous. And as soon as they saw this happen and they saw Schultz fling him over onto his back on the dirt, they went running. Wow. And they went to work on that guy like he was one of the wrestlers. <laughs> they were using those straps on him, right? Mm. I mean, just tearing him up. God. Wow. The yeah. police couldn't stop him. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then they would, they finally turned around and they took the other end of the belt. Because at this point, when a guy does that, hey, you know, there, there, there's no consequence to a wrestler for hurting somebody yes. if he does something like yeah, that. Right. Yeah. yeah. He wants to wrestle. He wants to fight. Whatever mm -hmm. it is, here it is. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I saw a couple of them take the belts and, and grab the bottom, the back of them 
the other end and hit him with the belt buckle. Ooh, ooh. Ping, ping. It was caught yeah. like that off of his head. And I'm screaming at him, stop it, stop it. The cops are trying to get him to stop. Uh, so we got a brawl and a riot going before the roster gets to the ring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, that's the kind of heat that's in the building at this point. So so wow. we, get, we finally get, I get him back to the ring, and Schultz comes on to the ring. So uh, uh, then later on, toward the end of the match, Schultz gets out of the ring. And uh, they start strapping him, Bob Armstrong and Mike Stallings and, uh, you know, uh, the entire group of baby faces are just wearing him out. But instead of him coming to the ring, he starts to the back of the building, toward the back of the building. And uh, and uh, the referee's in the ring. It's, it's referee and Charlie Cook. And then the referee sees it so out of hand that he gets out of the ring and he goes to the back of the building, too. Like he might be able to help stop this thing that's yeah. going on, right? Yeah. And that left poor old Charlie Cook standing in the ring alone, watching the brawl that was going on at the back of the building. Wow. And uh, everybody went to the back of the building except for me, Dave. Mm-hmm. And I just kind of squatted down there by the ring, by below ring level. And uh, and now there's Charlie Cook up there by himself. And he had no idea I was there. So I just sneaked up in the ring behind him and I wrapped my belt real slowly around my fist. Took the metal buckle that was on the end of it, made sure that covered the top of my fist, and I nailed him in the back of the head. Oh, no. <laughs> and he went down face first. I got out of the ring and hit again until everybody came back to the ring, and then Schultz just climbed up in the ring, and there laid Charlie Cook, rolled him over, and covered him. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Are you kidding, Ron? I mean, this stud cast cat get, is not going to get any crazier. And listen, you said the guy comes running down from the stage. I thought it was a plant. I thought it was part of the action. So now no, you're saying it was he's not. he's a fan, man. I know. <laughs> I know. He was a fan. Oh. Jeez. Yeah, wow. But, I mean, all of us knew it immediately. You yeah. Know? Like, hey, yeah. what is this, man? <laughs> you know? So it, it, it's, it's, we're having a pretty wild night here, man, yeah. after a wild TV. Yeah, sure. I can say. All right. So what happens next? Well, uh you know, uh, so <laughs> the match was over, and uh, Schultz got his hand raised, and uh, me and Schultz and all the heels and all the policemen fought our way back to the dressing room through two or three hundred people. Man, I mean, the TV had that had it, been, it had been the strongest one yet, man. Uh, you know, and uh, and uh, the attendance, man, that's what was wonderful. I mean, this TV that had just happened uh, six days earlier had lit things up, man. And it kind of showed the power, man, of pushing the heels, man. Uh, that night, the box office, man, uh, was up by 400 fans. We went from 2,300 to 2,700. Wow. Uh, biggest jump, biggest one-week attendance jump uh, in southeastern Gulf Coast uh, history so far, man. Hey, I tell you what, I'm sorry to say, Ron, but we do not have enough time for today's learning tree. I don't think that that's going to be a big problem, though, after a stud cast like this one, because it has really been a big one. Okay, folks on Facebook, become friends with Ron. You can only do it by going to his Ron Fuller, the Tennessee Stud Facebook page. Like him and follow him there, and you automatically become friends with a legend. You can follow him at Ron Fuller Welch on Twitter. His website, visit that too. The stud is always on this website. It's tremendous, tnstud.com. You're going to find great videos, a photo gallery, every stud cast ever ever done, 43 super stud caster there also. Shop the stud store for all kinds of souvenirs. I mean all kinds. Personally autographed photos. The classic Continental Video 5-pack. The Tennessee Stud Mask and the thrilling lion novel, Brutus, and you can get those autographed as well. Southeastern Rewind on YouTube is still full of great shows and information about their streaming channel. Find it all now on ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Ron's fantastic streaming channel. It's all there and always will be. Two superstars of the past series, Abraham Lincoln and Martin Farmer Burns. Now, 35 Continental TV shows, 23 USA TV shows, 
31 stud stories. Three stars of the sport with Andre the Giant, Mankind Mick Foley, and now legendary Ron Wright. Three documentaries with Wildcat Wendell Cooley, world premiere of Tony Anthony's Dirty White Boy, plus a tremendous two-hour special of Mongolian Stomper matches. More than 100 hours of old-school entertainment now, and it's only the beginning. Subscribe now at ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. Only $4.99 per month or $39.99 per year. It's fast becoming the best old-school streaming site on the entire planet. Don't miss this special offer right now for a limited time. Get a free one-week trial on ClassicContinentalWrestling.com. This has been absolutely a tremendous stud cast today, stud. I'm sure most everybody that listen feels like I do. And if so, please tell your friends about us because they are only going to get better. So where do we ride next week and how do you top it? Well, we've just scratched the surface of this problem, man, from the David Schultz personality profile blunder, man. Uh, we haven't gotten to the repercussions of this. And it's going to affect the new company, man, in a very dramatic way. We're going to continue with great TVs and shows in southeastern Gulf Coast and southeastern Knoxville. We'll be talking about the last week in May of 1978 for both of the companies in the next studcast. And we're definitely going to get to the learning tree question, man. Uh, the one that wasn't answered today, along with many other things, such as uh, Southeastern Knoxville's community involvement program that Les Thatcher had put together that was going to benefit uh, individuals in that part of the country. Uh, it's a really great program that uh, it's going to help uh, uh, Southeastern Knoxville to become an even better company uh, by getting involved in the community. Cool. So cool. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here today with us and, and for your support and Please take care of yourselves and others, and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at davidsummersproductions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud. LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic stud cast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.